so thank you for doing this. Uh, we, I understand that your, your time is, uh, is very stretched, so uh, we appreciate it and it's, and it's good to see you. Um, so we're going to start, first question. Um, so we're having this conversation in the midst of the worst public health crisis in more than 100 years. Um, and Southern Africa in particular is uh, experiencing some of the um, most severe consequences. Um, and yet what we're suggesting that is in the midst of all the circumstance, um, governments around the world um, need to recognize that COVID is going to be a part of the future. Um, it's a fact of life, it's part of a new reality. Um, and they need to be able to, while still managing the pandemic, um, begin to move forward, um, specifically um, to pay attention to the danger of backtracking on key human development indicators like, like health and education, um, but also mapping a way forward um, for economic recovery. Um, do you think it is premature to have that conversation or this is a good time? Well, the, the, this is a good time to have this conversation. From my experience, we've been involved in trying to deal with the COVID-19 since March. Mm -hmm. And a false start in March, we had a, a, a quick lockdown. But before long, we noticed that uh, the costs and the impacts of a lockdown are even more dangerous and bigger than uh, dealing with the disease. So since May, we have now been uh, trying to understand how we keep the economy open while at the same time preventing uh, uh, infections. So uh, I think you're right. The COVID is becoming a way of life. There's already many ways in which we are uh, changing our daily behavior. So yes, and now it's time to have this conversation. So the so the the premise is um, that um, investment in in human development, in health and education in particular, but also obviously many other areas uh, related to human development, um, it, it correlates to economic growth. Um, and you've been finance minister for many years, so uh, I'm, I'm imagining that you've had opportunity to see whether this is in fact the case. Um, do, do you, are you able to say um, that um, because of the investments in these areas over the past number of years, the Sutu has seen economic benefit? Well, the Sutu is, is a, a, a bit of a peculiar country. And I, I, was, I was looking at, at, at this question to try to understand whether we have evidence that can confirm uh, such a relationship. But Lesotho is peculiar in, in that compared to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, it invests twice more than uh, the rest of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa does. But the outcomes uh, it is absolutely terrible. So yes, lots of investments uh, last two decades compared to the to Sub-Saharan Africa, but the health outcomes and education outcomes uh, are very poor. If if we were to look at um, uh, where you are seeing some value of investment in education, for example, it is investment in tertiary education. Uh, the, yeah, the returns there are clear and uh, significant, but the returns are to a very small section of society, the larger portion of our youth who, who are drop out at, at basic education level, remain outside the economy. And by the way, uh, Lesotho is a country that has repented more on migrant labor, as well as uh, uh, international taxes from our arrangement called SACU. So the, the normal 
process of countries starting small, everybody hustling for a life and creating um, rudimentary markets hasn't really grounded in Lesotho. And so that, that, uh, that relationship is not very clear, uh, but it's not lost on us. That, that's, that's a path we need to travel. Uh, the migrant labor uh, process is, is winding up. There's only very few people now in, in South Africa. And uh, uh, SACU revenues and SACU itself is probably going to uh, disappear in the context of continental and uh, regional free trade areas. So uh, we need to get to a point where that relationship will actually we, uh, must come that we recognize that it must be the case that if you invest in people and invest in everybody and give them good health, necessarily you must reap uh, better uh, returns in economic growth. Um, so as you now prioritize um, moving forward, uh, I, you have two challenges. I'm sure your own reserves have been severely strapped um, by, the, by the current situation, together with the fact that um, the external budgetary support, the development aid um, that, that Lesotho receives, um, is, is also likely to be diminished because of the, of the global uh, economic um, recession. Um, you mentioned quality um, as a, as a particular problem in, in education and, and in health, that the outcomes are, are not what they should be. Um, do you see quality as being a, a high return investment at this point? We are a great and we have uh, these discussions about what we must do in education and what we must do in health. The problem of investing too much and getting too little out of it, uh, here it speaks to the the quality of the education that we must have. We recognize that um, while we are investing significant amounts in tertiary education, it, it is in basic education that we must invest. But uh, investments in basic, basic education is to creating what type of skills uh, we should participate in which industries in our society. So there's a big issue of relevance. Uh, uh, you train uh, hundreds of thousands of people, they come out of primary school, but what can they do in our economy? It's very little linkages between the jobs that are available in Lesotho and the skills that we are creating at the basic level. Even at the tertiary level, uh, most people are trained to uh, is, is essentially uh, join the government sector. Uh, and in health, we have been putting significant amounts of money, but uh, we, we still have facilities that uh, our people don't want to go to and don't trust. Uh, you may have a facility, you may not have nurses, or may not have enough doctors or, or medicines. So quality uh, is key uh, in health. Relevance and quality is key in education. And these are the areas where we want, we agreed that we must invest in. In fact, um, just, just last week, I've set up uh, different thematic groups of ministers, so investment ministers, infrastructure ministers, and then uh, social ministers. And I have, I'm in the process of you now, this gradually begins to. Uh, give them mandates. But one of the uh, principles that I've shared with them is that uh, you must then begin to work with each other. Investment, uh, infrastructure must serve both investment as well as uh, is, uh, social objectives. We want electricity in all the schools and in all the clinics. So what is the infrastructure group going to do uh, to be able to ensure that the basic minimums of infrastructure can be available. So yes, I think uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are beginning to think a little bit of working together as groups and doing away with the, uh, uh, the, the silo 
mentality that we have adopted the previous level. Yeah, so, so certainly I think um, COVID obviously has tested governments around the world like, like never before. And, and as, you, as you say, it's, it's the impacts are multi-sectoral. Um, so governments are going to be much better served by taking a more uh, collaborative um, approach. It's also probably one of the best ways to increase the impact of the available resources um, and, and the efficiency in, in, in delivery. Um, but you've been in government for many years. Um, oh, you, yeah. you, you know this creature very well. <laughs> and, and so my question is to you, now that you're in charge, how would you, what would you do? Uh, what are you planning to do um, to improve government effectiveness and efficiency? Well, the, the, clearly one of the first steps our first step was to define our priorities. I'm in charge now, but it's for the, only for the next two years. And then we have to go to an election. And so we don't know what, what's happening after the election. So the first was just how many uh, goals can we uh, chew in the remaining time? Uh, it's just clear there's a few things, a few uh, lofty goals that we must deliver on. COVID, we must uh, be ahead of the curve on COVID. Uh, food security, this is critical and it's fed. The food insecurity is fed by COVID, but this is coming on top of a, uh, a, a, a drought, a disaster, uh, and famine that we were already uh, undergoing from uh, a drought last year. Mm. So, uh, rolling out a food security plan and coupling that with growing more and more of our food is uh, our priority as well. Three is uh, uh, creating jobs for our youth. Uh, and fourth, of course, we are undergoing political reform and we must deliver on that political reform. And that political reform includes uh, looking at ways by which the civil service can be more effective. The Lesotho civil service is uh, it, it, it's heavy, uh, 45,000 for a small economy, and that produces uh, very little value for the taxpayers that are funded. So uh, among the political reforms that we are undertaking, the administrative reforms as well that uh, look at the public service. So one of the first steps then uh, in terms of effectiveness of all government is reorganizing government in terms of how do we uh, deliver the services that we have committed to pursue to. Uh, the office of the prime minister uh, needs to have a more active role rather than leave ministers to define what each individual minister must do. So yeah. in the office of the prime minister, we've set up two functions now. One, a results monitoring uh, function, as well as a, um, a delivery unit that is focusing entirely on investments and looking at removing investment roadblocks uh, on, a, on, a, on a weekly basis. So those are the four priorities and we will deal with these by uh, uh, reorganizing government, starting with the Office of the Prime Minister, uh, grouping ministers into uh, uh, clusters that work on uh, uh, common uh, themes. And these four broad areas that are defined, actually we have appointed now uh, ministerial committees that uh, work on those. But as, as a Prime Minister, I, ho I also have the prerogative of, of continually appointing ad hoc uh, groups to look at uh, issues that uh, come from time to time. Uh -huh. And how are your ministers adjusting to this uh, new collaborative ethos? Because ministers tend to want to compete, particularly if there's an election in two years, they want to shine out more than the other one. 
they are not going to do this willingly. So it takes me continually going in, into their meetings and say, no, I remember uh, this is the objective that we must achieve. And this is how you relate with each other and how you must help each other. Uh, so the communications minister might just be eager to run away with uh, broadcasting and or uh, uh, IT solutions and a, a, a road transport minister doesn't see how, how, how uh, they are linked. But when we define their work within the context of a geo an underprivileged geographical area in the middle of the sea and yeah. demonstrate yeah. that here poverty is pervasive, here malnutrition is pervasive, and what is lacking is electricity, is uh, telecommunications, it is your roads, uh, it is water. All those things must be there before you can improve the life of individuals. And it, it is when you bring in the social objectives into the discussion of infrastructure that they begin to see how they need each other and how they must uh, plan their work together uh, in a manner that can deliver a product uh, to the community out in the rural areas. We have produced uh, poverty maps and malnutrition maps, and we say your plan must stick to those maps. So, yes. It is a very interesting uh, process, but it, it requires going in and talking to them. And, and, uh, so this must be um, a severe test uh, for your, your leadership skills. Uh, you, you took over just as uh, the pandemic was really setting in. Um, you have a short uh, trajectory, two years, uh, to deliver results. You've defined your results nicely. Um, what have you learned as a leader and what would you share for others to, to reflect on? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm two months in, in the office, uh, but I was finance minister before and I've been uh, uh, a minister previously. So we, it, it, so I've always had a good sense of what we needed to do. And so coming in as premier uh, was an opportunity, a rare opportunity for anyone uh, who had wishes to, uh, to, to have. And so uh, the, the lesson was, uh, well, I come in knowing exactly what I'm going to do. Yeah, but now getting uh, ministers who are political leaders in their own right and my colleagues getting them to buy my vision uh, when in fact I come midstream and I'm not coming from an election and this, this is a constituency uh, parliamentary system not a presidential system uh, they don't know what I'm going to do in advance now getting them to be to buy that uh, vision requires a bit of work and so you, you go one by one, one by one, each minister. Um, and ministers are, and, and the ministers are, are not the same. Some are more uh, powerful and more dangerous. If they don't buy the vision, <laughs> they can be very disruptive. Uh, but if they buy vision, they can also be very... Uh, so you have, you have to be able to listen, uh, even if you disagree, and gradually... Uh, I uh, try to guide the process to a, a, a unitary vision which they buy into. So it is work that requires uh, talking to ministers individually and collectively. And uh, quite frankly, sometimes you need to be stronger and wield a little bit of a command and control stick. But you, you combine all those um, uh, instruments together. Uh, it's still, frankly, early stage. Uh, I'm refining my approaches and I'm learning as I, as I go. 
but I don't want to lose sight of what we need to do. Uh, our poor people, hungry people, are at the center of our discussions daily. And that uh, always rejuvenizes and, and uh, reorganizes our thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Well, you still look uh, young and, and energetic, so um, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's a good thing. Um, so, Prime Minister, thank you so much for this.